Hi, everyone. My name is Erica Carey, and I'm from Renewed Living. And welcome back to my speaker series. Today, we have joining us Billy Sinclair, who is a financial literacy educator, and she is going to be discussing a very important financial topic with us today, which is wills and estate preparation. And I think it's also something that's very near and dear to your heart as well. So please welcome Billy Sinclair. Thank you so much, Erica. I appreciate you very much. And I appreciate that we really are committed to some very similar things uh, to help people live their lives better and, and with more resources. Uh, so just as a brief introduction, I have been in the financial industry in one way or another for many years, a few decades. And uh, the reason I'm so interested in this topic, and I appreciate you for inviting me to share, is that um, six years ago, I, my family suffered a tragedy, which was the death of my brother, and he died by suicide. And so that added, of course, a huge layer of complication just to the grief and the situation. He died without a will, but it didn't seem to be a problem at the time because he had no property, he had no car, he had no money in the bank. And in fact, he was on short term leave from his employment. So, you know, it just sometimes we think people that have a lot of money need wills. And sometimes we forget that people that have very small amount of resources also need wills. Mm -hmm. So what ended up happening was that uh, after he passed, and I let the CRA know that he had died, they asked me to catch up five years of his tax returns. And when I did that, they gave him a $6,000 refund. And of course, that check came payable to me. He had no children. Our mother died before him. Our other brother died before her. So it was just me. And this $6,000 came payable to his estate. And when I took the money to the bank, they said, well, if he died without a will, there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, we'll deposit the check for you as a courtesy, but you can't have this money and you best go see a lawyer. Wow. So to cut a long story short, that lawyer wanted a $5,000 retainer and wanted to charge me $300 an hour. So I began looking for other resources. And so the resource I'm going to share with you today helped me solve that problem. Uh, I had quite a steep learning curve when it came to wills and estates. Uh, but it's, you know, just part of my nature and because it's a very important tool in our financial toolkit, I decided to start educating people on the importance of wills and estates and tools that I found to make it easy. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. So I'll go ahead and uh, start sharing my screen. And then okay. we'll have a short PowerPoint presentation. And if you have questions along the way, I'm sure you'll have great questions that your readers or your viewers will, will also have. And yeah. so maybe what we'll do is we'll do a bit of a Q&A at the end. Sounds um, good. In case I leave anything out. Okay, wonderful. Let's bring that out. There we go. That's the screen I want. And can you see everything okay, Erica? Yeah, looks good to me. Wonderful. So uh, this slide presentation has actually been put together by myself and some of my colleagues. Uh, we're known as Ladies of Justice and we're part of an organization called Legal Shield and very committed to affordable access to legal advice. So a fact of the matter is that only about 49% of Canadians do have their will done. For a lot of people, they know it's important and it's on their list of things to do, but it's also sometimes quite cost prohibitive. So when I got my first will done, I actually paid $800 to do that. And a lot of people just don't have $800 that they feel like it now is the right time to put it into their budget. So that's one of the many reasons that people in Canada don't have a will is because of the cost. Also, we have some perceptions around this whole topic, which we can't not discuss. Um, I don't need it if I want everything to go to my kids. That's an unfortunate uh, thing that a lot of people believe. I've had even someone say to me, well, if something happens to me, won't my condo go to my parents? And the answer is no, it won't. So nothing goes to anyone 
unless we say so. Some people say, I don't have anything. Well, of course, that was my brother's situation. And it did seem like, although he had a cute little apartment in Gastown, lots of nice possessions, he didn't think he had anything. And most people that have a small amount are actually in a more difficult position because of the cost of the family gaining access to that small amount. It ends up being just a very hard decision as to how far you're willing to go or are we just going to let this money sit with the bank indefinitely? Some people do think it's too expensive and that it takes too long. Well, it can be expensive. And that's why I'm excited to share resources that are affordable. Coming from a background in financial literacy, I am not about wasting money. I'm about using money very, very wisely. And so to find tools that uh, make that possible for my friends, family, business associates and colleagues, it's just very, very important. And then some people might say it takes too long. Well, it takes as long as it takes. And it taking too long is just not a valid excuse. It's not easy decisions that we're making. Uh, where are our possessions going to go? What is our division of assets? Who's gonna look after our pets, our children? Who's gonna take care of making sure that all these things are done according to our desires? It's not an easy decision and it doesn't have to take too long, but we are the ones that have to kind of, you know, put that commitment into the picture to answer the questions that we need to answer. So the good news is that actually Legal Shield makes it very, very easy and affordable. So I do want to talk about this tool that I found. Legal Shield is a network of law firms around North America, and we offer a subscription. And along with that subscription, which is a small monthly fee for a family, it's $24.95. Will preparation is part of that package. So we just want to show you that there are happy people that have used our service. We have millions of members, a uh, couple of interesting testimonials. I won't read them. I know how slides go. People are already reading them. So that's just um, a way of showing people that, you know, these are real people that use this service to get their wills done. Oops. There we go. The first step, of course, is to get what we call the will questionnaire. Now, the will questionnaire can be found on the Legal Shield app, but not everyone likes to use apps for everything. So we use a will questionnaire on paper, and there are 20 questions that we're going to cover a little bit about here. If you are going to use the app, of course, it follows, uh, you just follow along with the instructions, but I prefer to give everyone a copy of the will questionnaire, which is um, available even on PDFs. You can just print it at home yourself or available to have it mailed out. And the general information, uh, what I say to people is that grab your questionnaire and put it in a bright colored folder and keep it on top of your desk or your dining room table or your kitchen counter because the 20 questions, some of them you can get through pretty fast and it feels really good as you're knocking off those questions. So I say, keep it front and center and start to answer one to two questions a day. And in less than 20 days, you will have your document completed. So of course the easy stuff, the uh, general information, name, address, phone number, uh, location and, and some of that easy stuff, we could get through it pretty quickly. And then we're going to move into a little bit more information about our partner, our spouse, uh, a little bit of information if you had marriages and divorces. So it is important to mention in your will if you've had a divorce or more than one divorce. I actually had two by the time I wrote my final will. And it's just something you might have to dig up the information. What were the divorce dates? But it's all important to have these details uh, spelled out in your will so that there's no confusion. The dependent information, that's very important. Nowadays, we have a lot of families that are yours, mine, and ours. I was just uh, discussing this with a young lady yesterday. She's got kids of her own. He's got kids of his own and they don't have any kids together. So she wanted to make sure that if something happens to her, that her son is treated fairly 
in you know, the division of assets. So dependents are very, very important. And we even ask questions about the grandchildren. So names and birth dates, any special needs, uh, you'll want to select, uh, you could call it a custodian or a guardian. And another thing that comes up is disinheritance and special requests. So I was speaking with a lady today about potentially uh, disinheriting her brother because she felt that he has just been nothing but a problem for her. Now, you know, we are not obligated to give our resources to anyone, but other family members could potentially challenge our will. So we put a lot of detail into the will about some of those decisions so that when you're discussing it with the lawyer, he'll be able to sign off on it and say, okay, I understand why you've written this person in or this person out, and it does make sense. Special requests are such things as heirlooms, for example. You might have special things that you want to go to certain individuals. And so all of these things can be detailed in our will questionnaire. Asset information, of course, is very important. And what goes into your will are any assets that do not have a designated beneficiary. Now, Life insurance, for example, has a designated beneficiary, but you might think that pensions have a designated beneficiary, like if you have a pension at work. Well, you know, the company will honor that pension for you if you die, but you might not have gotten around to adding a beneficiary to their paperwork. So it's really important that we think about our designated beneficiaries and that we do add them to anywhere that they are allowed. As I shared about my brother's situation, bank accounts do not have a designated a beneficiary. So it's really important just to put in your questionnaire um, who is going to be your executor, who are going to receive the results of your assets, and then where are these assets? Uh, which banks? You don't have to get super specific like about bank accounts and everything because that could change in five years. But what you're doing here is you are giving your executor guidance so that they know that they have to look through your papers and maybe they have to contact the uh, you know particular bank and say well you know my family member passed away but I understand that they have assets here and then that executor's job is to go ahead and you know do as you wished so other kinds of things that don't have a beneficiary that's designated is your real estate your cars uh, typically, your retirement plans do and your life insurance policies do, even your investments do. But then again, your banking, they do not have beneficiary designation. So it's just really important to uh, look through all of your papers. End of life requests. You know, what's going to happen here is you're going to choose a few different options uh, based on BC law and based on what do you want to have happen to your assets. I did have someone ask me last week, you know, uh, my mother, my father, yada, yada, do I have rights to their assets? Well, in fact, children do not. You, the parent, has the ability to decide how you're going to divide your assets. Now, as I said earlier, the lawyer is going to want to understand why you made the decision that you made. So for example, let's say you have three children, but you've got uh, one of them had already received a large amount of money from you for a business they wanted to start or a house they wanted to buy. And so now you feel that looking at your assets, you really want to give a fair division. So you won't like, let's say they gave Johnny a hundred thousand. What's going to happen is they might say, well, we want now for the, his sisters and brothers to get this much money, and then Johnny will get his share after that because he already received a portion. So we just really want to know that it's important that all of these things are spelled out in detail. Also, as I shared earlier about heirlooms, these things are important. Some families are really attached to some of their possessions and they really want certain things to go to certain things. But also you are going to have the opportunity to even talk about your pet care. Who is going to be in charge of your fur babies, as we call them? And are you going to make special arrangements for a certain amount of money to be left to that family member so that they can take good care of your fur baby? 
uh, what is going to happen with your social media accounts, for example. Um, you know, sometimes you know that a friend has passed away and their social media account is now monitored and, you know, kept up by a family member. So again, these are decisions that we want to make for ourselves. And then we take the will questionnaire and we submit it to our provider law firm. And it's very important that, uh, you know, we get to have a consultation with it because sometimes when you have questions, uh, or, or most of us just don't know all of this. This is kind of new territory for us. So we want to ask questions and say, well, if we did it this way, what would that mean? If we wrote it that way, what would that mean? So it's really great and very important to have legal advice. I, I have been asked in the past if I can just get a will kit, you know, a kit from Staples. And yes, you can. Uh, it is legal in BC to write your will, sign it, and have your signature witnessed by people that are not named in the will. But I always feel like this is the most important document that we can write. These are assets for our lifetime. These might be our children, our grandchildren. They're the most important people to us. So we don't want to take a chance and not write things properly. So that's why we're going to take advantage of legal advice when we can have it in, in an affordable way. Alrighty, so that was basically our demo there. So you could see that I think I am at this end of my slides. Yep. So you could see all the details and I will stop sharing now. Thank you. And I'm back. Hi, thanks. That was really, really informative. Because <laughs> there's things that you don't think of like pet care. And, you know, and that's something that's really important, especially to those, because there's a lot of people, people in my life too, that don't have children, but they have pets and those are their babies. And, you know, it's important who's going to take care of them. And um, maybe if they have a health issue or they need to take ongoing medication or whatever, you need to, you know, think about that and prepare for that and who can take that on, just like when you're thinking about your children. <laughs> So right. And you know, sometimes when everything's going fine, someone will agree to that. And then if something happens, you know, they have the right to change their mind. Yeah. So we do have things, uh, provisions for having like a secondary person named. This is true for the executor, for the guardian, and also uh, for your fur babies. So if the person that you originally named either can't or won't undertake that task, then of course you've named a secondary person. And, and it doesn't mean that your family wasn't nice. What if they moved into an apartment and they can't take pets? Like nobody says, yeah. well, I'm not going to move into this apartment just in case my brother passes away and I <laughs> look after his dog. I hope you not. Know? So <laughs> we don't plan our lives like that. So sometimes it's not that they're not being nice. It's just that their circumstances changed. And so we need to really think about, you know, who would be our alternative, our alternates. Absolutely. And when my husband did our will, um, what prompted us to do it, I guess, was when we had our first child. And because we were both, you know, we we're in our late 20s and we thought, we don't have a will. <laughs> and we own property, we have some assets. Um, and now we have a child. <laughs> so we really should do something about this. And so, yeah, in the will, amongst all the other stuff we did, we added, you know, who would be their guardians if something were to happen to both of us at the same time. And then we also added a secondary person just in case, because the people we chose, like our first choice was my sister and brother-in-law, and they're a lot older than me. And, you know, things change. Um, they may not want to take on two little boys and, you know, anything can happen. And so it's good to have that backup and and just, yeah, just remember those kinds of things with anything in there, really, just to have a secondary person. So, yeah. Another question that people often ask me is, can I just write my will once and then just like file it and forget about it? So you brought up such a good point there, Erica, is that first you had this one child and you were thinking about your will. And now you had a second child and oh. you certainly then want to update your will and even though our addresses change and our phone numbers change and even our bank accounts and our assets change, what you're really doing is guiding the executor. The executor has all the hard work and 
sometimes people just, again, they don't want to spend the money, so they don't want to change their will. But it is, again, a benefit of Legal Shield. As you've got your plan going, you can continue to upgrade your will at least once a year to just check and make sure that everything is still accurate. You might have had deaths in the family. You might have had births in the family. And actually, one of my clients did pass away. Unfortunately, she passed away at home unexpectedly. She had an accident in her apartment. And she wasn't found until the landlord realized that she hadn't paid her rent. So she went in to check on her and she did have a will, but her first executor was actually her brother and her brother had passed away before her. And so those are things, you know, when, when he passed away, she knew she should rewrite her will. Yeah. Cause there's no backup executor. She did. I, she actually did have a backup. Executor. Good. Good. Yeah. Uh, and the good thing was that I knew him and I didn't know her brother, but I knew him because lots of times when people are doing their wills, they discuss these things with me. Uh, it's not, ob- it's not obligatory or anything like that, but it just happens sometimes. And so I was able to reach out to her executor, her secondary And we were able to discuss how he was going to, you know, sort of let the courts know that the first executor had predeceased our friend and that he was the one that was in line to take over and help make those um, take the actions that she had wanted taken. So uh, that's important to rewrite our wills, to keep them reasonably up to date. Uh, I also had a situation where the executor that I had uh, named in my will So I have three children, but I figured if something happened to me, they would be so devastated that they just might not be up for the task of, you know, all the executor stuff. And so I had named a girlfriend and she advised me a couple of years later that she and her boyfriend were going off the grid, she said, (laughs) and they were going to live somewhere. And she was going to leave her job at the city of Vancouver. And I was like, oh, dear, if anything (laughs) happens to me. What if nobody can find you? Yeah. So, you know, people change their minds. And so I had to go back to the law firm and I had to talk to my children. And I did end up naming one of my children as the executor. And she's going to, you know, be it not necessarily in partnership with her sibling because one of her sisters lives in China. So there's another complication for families that families can be all over. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to give them the task of making the decisions jointly. If they're not a they don't get along, that would be unpleasant. Yeah. And B, if they just, you know, the different parts of the world and and, uh, hard to communicate. So, you know, when you're thinking about who should be your executor, obviously, someone that's reasonably able to take on the tasks and then someone that's here in bc is ideal oh for sure yeah and maybe i'll just tell you one more story okay yeah i love your stories (laughs) so uh my girlfriend actually passed away two years ago so she was 66 perfectly healthy as far as we knew she went to work on friday went to dinner on Friday night and went home to bed on Friday night and did not wake up on Saturday. So it was very shocking to all of us. Uh, One of my girlfriend of our other girlfriends went and checked on her and, and found, you know, that she had passed in her sleep, but her siblings all live in Ontario. And so we had to scramble and reach out to her siblings. Fortunately, just because of the work that we do, we have each other's phone numbers. We have each other's siblings, phone numbers across the country. And her three, two, uh, sister, brother, and brother and and sister-in-law, sorry, all came out. They had to spend all this time on their vacation, take two weeks off to come to Vancouver and deal with the apartment, dispose of all her possessions because they couldn't take anything on the plane back to Ontario. So they had to hire 1-800-GOT-JUNK to dispose of everything. That was $1,800. Wow. And then they had to fend for themselves for two weeks, feeding themselves. Uh, they stayed in her apartment. Um, and, and actually, one night they decided they were going to stay in a hotel because it just felt like they needed a break. Oh, definitely. So, yeah. yeah. Just to tell you all this to say, you know what? She died without a will. Her will was at the law firm waiting for signature. Never happened. And her bank account had 
just about like $5,400 in between her check-in and savings. And the family, the siblings that spent all this money and time and energy coming here could not access that money. We literally went to the bank together and the bank was like, yeah, sorry about that. Nothing we can do for you. Even though had the will been signed, this sister whom I went to the bank with was named the executor. So uh-huh. you're not an executor unless you oh, got everything signed, sealed, and delivered. Yeah. And so two years later, we're still working on the paperwork to get that done because who knew? Then we had COVID. Then we had all the complications with offices being closed, the yeah. courts being closed, staff not being on site. And so you just, you have no way of knowing all these things. You can't be prepared for everything. So having your will done at the earliest possible time um, in the most affordable way, it's, it's just a, a, it's just the right thing to do. And I always say we do it for our families. So Absolutely. I'll end with that. We do it for our families. Yeah, for sure. And that actually brings me to a question um, and it relates to what happened to your friend there. What happens if someone doesn't have a will? Like what is the long-term result? Like can people fight it and like the family members, can they eventually get things or does it go to the government or what happens to well, all that? That is family? a great question. Absolutely. So similar to when my brother died and I got the $6,000 check payable to his estate, we're doing the same kind of process. Now, I know this is going to be backwards there, but this is called <laughs> the British Columbia probate kit and it's available at Staples for about 40 bucks. And in there are all the documents that you have to submit to the BC courts to let them know that you're the person who should administer that individual's affairs. And it it can take a year to get, because they're obviously very careful. They're not just going to let anyone do that. So I had to get permission letters from all three of her siblings. And I'll have to attach that to the grant because they'll want to know, well, why are you applying for? to administer your girlfriend's money when she has brothers and sisters. Well, the brothers and sisters are not Ontario. And so they, and they don't know anything about this stuff. So they just feel really ill-equipped to deal with it. So they asked me if I would, and as a friend, I will. But um, another question that might come out of that, Erica, is, uh, but do I have to do this for free? Like I'm spending hours and hours. This friend's, estate so that I can give the money to her siblings like why am I doing this so an executor can actually or not just an executor but an administrator can charge the estate a fee for doing it for them if you took it to the bank they would do it for you and they would charge you a hefty fee so Mm -hmm. typically that would only happen if that family member that passed was quite wealthy so if you decided well I'll do this for the family, but I'm going to charge them 500 bucks because it's going to take you many hours away from your job, your family, your personal life to do it. That's, that's legit. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. Um, another question I had, it's kind of, it relates more to, um, well, I guess a bit power of attorney, but also um, kind of uh advanced directives that kind of thing um and it what brought it up for me is it's um a close family friend well friend of my mom's of 45 years um her and her husband um her husband has he's in the advanced stages of alzheimer's and um she physically is not well and so they're kind of in a state where they really should be in some form of retirement living situation where they get that support or at least in home care. And what we're concerned about, because they definitely have not updated their will or power of attorney or anything like that. And now that her husband is in the advanced stages of Alzheimer's, if something were to happen to her, um, where she either needed to go into long-term care, like immediately, let's say she had a stroke or something and had to, um, he's not, able to make those decisions now um what like what does someone do in that scenario because they have no family all they have is my mom basically and so she's been really trying to like you know work on her on that but it's a touchy subject and it's Mm -hmm. it's hard right so I don't know if you have any answers for that but well one of the 
things that we didn't talk about as to why people don't do this is because it's a touchy subject. Yeah. Nobody wants to think about their passing. And even if you're not healthy, you still want to live 10 more years or 20 more years or whatever, you know, we just don't want to be thinking about passing. So it is very, very difficult. And when there are no family members who would step up and take on that responsibility, you might have heard of the public guardian and trust. Yeah, and so actually, yeah. that's who the hospital would end up getting engaged in the situation. And thank you for bringing up the topic of the powers of attorney, because those are included in our will kit. And so the powers of attorney can be as or more important than the will, because sometimes, you know, you're in a car accident and uh, you don't die, but you're laid up for quite a while. So who's going to make your medical decisions while, or your financial decisions while you're in a coma for a couple of weeks? Yeah, who's yeah, going to make your sure bills or that your bills whatever. get paid? Who has access to the keys to your apartment because you were out and now you've got a dog and a cat that now needs to be taken care of, never mind children. Yeah. So, you know, the powers of attorney are extremely important. So the, the health care, as you mentioned, the, the health care directive will guide the doctors as to make your decisions uh, health wise. But then you need the financial power of attorney, uh, because, again, if you're just going to be sick for a few months, uh, you'll want to have, you know, the financial things taken care of. You yeah. don't want to come home and have your power turned off and your you know, internet gone and, and things like that. And they haven't heard from you and they don't know why they haven't heard from you. And that also messes with your credit score because now yeah. these bills that you've been paying regularly, now they're no longer, you know, reporting R1. Now they're going to report R2, R3, or 4 R5 because unfortunately you're not there to take care of it. And, uh, and sometimes you, you made a good point that they're both not in a condition to take care of things. So if something happens to her, he can't speak for her. No, because they I, won't allow it. No, right? it's very scary. So so yeah, it's very important um, when there is no family. And I do want to mention one other thing. Sometimes there is family, but there's conflict in the family. Yeah. So I had another situation where the gentleman ended up going in for heart surgery, just completely sudden, no warning whatsoever. He lived with his girlfriend, but he had two grown up daughters. And so for no particular reason, the grown up daughter called his boss and said, I'll pick up my dad's last paycheck. And maybe that was just by habit, because you're thinking, that's my dad, I better help him take care of his finances. But forgetting that he has a woman that he lives with. Yeah. And so she was kind of more the person who should have reached out to the boss. So she did reach out to the boss to ask about the last paycheck. And then the boss felt like, well, now I don't know who to give it to because now there's a conflict in the family. Nobody actually has the rights to it because there's no power of attorney. Mm -hmm. And so the boss just decided that he would not give the final paycheck to anyone until the man who had the heart problem recovered and he was able to say where should the money go and it turned out it went to the girlfriend or it should be picked up by the girlfriend yeah. but it just goes to show you there's so many family things that are involved oh, yeah. and it's so much straightforward I'm not saying there wouldn't be any conflicts but it's certainly more straightforward when the person can just go to the boss and say I have the power of attorney I'd like to pick up the final paycheck because I have his wallet. I have his bank card. I'd like to deposit it into his bank account and I have the rights. Yeah. So sometimes um, just to wrap up that question, you will get some latitude. When my brother died, I had no rights for anything, but his landlord was very generous to me. And he said, sure, here's the keys. Come in, take whatever you can after you've taken whatever you can, we'll clean up the rest. I mean, that okay. was not, you can't expect that. I just got lucky on that one. I normally would have had to show up and prove that I had the rights to, yeah. you know, to his property, to his bank account. Um, you know, you, you just take so much of this for granted because we don't want anything to happen. But things do happen every day. Yeah. And you need to prepare for it. And 
I've been really lucky. My family has always been very open about like when it comes to wills and planning for stuff like so much so that I remember being a teenager and um, you know, my, I had a lot of great aunts um, growing up. So my mom had a lot of aunts and two of them were sisters. They lived together. And I remember they called my sister and I, and they wanted us to come over for lunch and literally go around the house and put our names on items like possessions that we want because they were updating their will. And we just thought, this is so weird. <laughs> it didn't feel right, but it was so smart. Like, cause they were preparing it. They were um, updating their will. So on top of like the financial aspects, they, there was certain, you know, possessions that they wanted to remain in the family and they wanted to make sure that it went to the right people. And so they wrote it in while we were there. And my mom is now starting to do stuff like that. And so we've always openly discussed it. And I think it's a really good thing, a good conversation to have. It, you know, it's hard. It can be very uncomfortable, but it is so important. Um, I have, uh, and people think, you know, like, oh, I'm too young. I don't need to worry about that until I'm old, but then it's too late and something can still happen when you're young. I have, um, a good friend of mine. She has a son who's best friends with my son. And, um, I don't know how the topic came up, but we were talking about wills the other day. And, um, I asked her, I said, do you have a will? And she said, no, should I? And I'm thinking, you have a son. Yes. <laughs> Where's all your stuff going to go? Who's going to look after your son? Like all of this stuff, right? So yeah, it's just funny. People just think, no, that's something you do when you're older, but you should, the sooner the better, I think. So yeah. Well, I could certainly keep you all day with stories <laughs> because I've got a pile of them and maybe someday I'll tell you some more of them or we'll have a follow-up. Yes, I'd love to hear series. Yeah, um, because you're absolutely right. I mean, even just on the construction, I'm looking at a construction site from my window. Uh, there's a hundred young men down there. Oh, there's a hundred men of all ages, I guess. Anything could happen. We've yeah. seen accidents where the crane falls Thanks, apart, Kelowna, yeah. in Kelowna, and then there's deaths, and nobody thinks about not coming home from work tonight. But it absolutely could happen. And having a will is just a little bit of adulting. Uh, no offense to your lady friend who said, you know, should I? <laughs> should I? <laughs> You know, yes, you should. Yes, you should. Yeah. And even if you have adult children that live at home still, they should have one too. Because like I said, if there's 900 or $3,900 in the bank, when you pass away, nobody is getting that money. It's going to sit there. And the bank, yeah. actually, I checked on my girlfriend's bank account the other day, and it's gone down by $1,000. And I said to the bank, Why? who's uh, there should be no fees on this account mm -hmm. the person passed away two years ago and they're like yeah we can't tell you oh no yeah come back when you have the grant of administration and we'll tell you where the money's going so if it takes me another year maybe another five hundred dollars is going to be gone from the bank account then i'm going to have to fight to get it back yeah yeah it's tough yeah. So very, very get important. your wills done. <laughs> get your wills done. Maybe you'll introduce me to your friend there and I can help her. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me and being part of my speaker series. I really appreciate it and all the information that you've provided. Thank you. You're most welcome. It's my pleasure. I'm looking forward to lots of people uh, getting educated and, and taking action. Really, really Absolutely. important. And thank you for the opportunity, Erica. You're welcome. Bye-bye.